Hello, hi everyone, and welcome to a new session, a new Microsoft Reactor session. Uh, today we are going to do a gentle introduction to um, Azure AI in 2023 and demystify a little bit uh, what is all this media hype about of those days. I'm Carlotta Castelluccio, Cloud Advocate at Microsoft, focused on artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies. And I'm so happy to be here today with Amy, Amy Boyd, a fellow Cloud Advocate. Hi, Amy, how are you doing? Hi, Carlotta. Hi, everyone. Really, really good, thank you. So yeah, my name is Amy Boyd. I'm also a Cloud Advocate here at Microsoft, and I'm currently running our data team. So it's a really interesting connection between data and AI. Absolutely, absolutely. And today, uh, to start, we would like to do a very quick competition, right, Amy? Absolutely. Let's jump straight into a quiz. I want everyone out there getting involved. So if you have another device or you have a web browser open, if you're on your laptop, um, please. Oh, sorry, one second. Code of conduct, of course. Um, please do check out our code of conduct. We have this with every reactor session, so be aware of others, be welcome and respectful, be understanding of our differences, be friendly and patient, open to questions and other viewpoints, and in general, kind and considerate. So, um, but feel free to ask questions in the chat, get involved with us here on the screen. We want to hear your thoughts and ideas as well as your questions. Um, so yeah, just keep in mind, please, our code of conduct for the reactor. Okay, let's jump into the quiz now. <laughs> Um, awesome. So we wanted to do a bit of a quiz to get started. So first things first, as I said, grab another device, open another browser window and head to menti.com or scan this QR code just here. Um, enter that code for us. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to do that. With Menti, what we're going to do is we're going to ask you four questions, and they're all about the acronyms that live in AI. So what we're going to find, obviously, uh, and I'm sure you've heard it all before in the media, everything has an acronym. If it's chat GPT, that might be one of our questions. What does that actually mean? Or um, any of the other acronyms that we use. So what we want to do is we want to immediately dismiss the demystify, but also understand how much you do already know about some of these pieces in AI. Um, Carlotta, you can see the back, the back screen. Have we got people signing up? Yeah, yeah, we have Amazing. more than 35 people already in here. So probably we can we can start, we can kick off. And, and please uh, continue to register to the survey and, and join our quick, quick survey. Fabulous. Okay, well, let's get started then. Let's jump into question number one. Um, what does AI stand for? So AI, oh, sorry. no problem. Yeah. AI is a very, very popular term. We use it in many places, in lo even lots of advertising now um, on sort of general mainstream media, um, AI kind of comes up everywhere. So do bear with us. This is, I promise you, this is worth the wait. <laughs> yeah, so, so sorry. Um, no, this is because we we are so, we tested it all before. I was our <laughs> quiz. I was like guinea pig in some senses for our quiz. Um, so resetted it. But yeah, no, we appreciate your signing up as well where we yeah. have 23 comments. Here we go, people from Kent, people from Israel, people from Bournemouth. Oh, fantastic, here we go. 44 players that allow more people to play. That's great. Yeah, and please okay. answer fast. Answer fast, you get more points and you head up the leaderboard. So what does AI stand for? You have 20 seconds. What I found was my uh, auto-suggest was completing some of it. And I said to Carlotta, I didn't know if that was because of how often I type these things in on Teams um, that it was learning. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. We have quite a few answer. Great stuff. So, so artificial intelligence. Um, so we have, yeah, a few different things, new technology. Ah, so what does it stand for and what does it mean? Sorry, yeah, we've, we've kind of misconstrued that a little bit. It stands for artificial intelligence, but what does it mean? 
could could mean new technologies but one of the ways that we kind of deem artificial intelligence is the capability of computer systems to mimic human cognitive functions few keywords in there mimic human and cognitive functions and i think a lot of that will come out in our talk today that we have to sometimes be careful of what we think that ai can do and, and what it can't do um as well as it allows us to kind of simulate this idea of making decisions so there's a lot in ai that leads to automation um, and so again we we will kind of talk through some of the decisions that are made and some of the things that people are currently doing right now so yeah, thank you everyone for getting involved. Question number two, Carlotta, I'll pass to you. Yes, question number two, and already 50 players ready to play. That's awesome. So again, please answer faster to get more points. So question number two is about NLP. What does NLP stand for? So what is this acronym mean exactly? Um, we have a few more seconds uh, for, for this question. Uh, <laughs> since the, the, the first one was very, uh, very easy, lots of you answer it correctly. So let's see for this uh, second one, uh, how many of you are able to, to guess it right. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, the, the, this is a competition, but feel free to uh, guess if you don't know the answer. Um, don't be shy. Don't be shy indeed. Okay. So the correct answer is natural language processing. Um, and again, we, we, we had lots of uh, guessing, lots of um, uh, quite answer, but also answer which are quite um, similar to the right one, like natural language pro programming uh, mm -hmm. could be um, uh, like similar to the, to the correct one. Um, that just to give you an idea of uh, not just what it's sent for, but also what it is uh, natural language processing. This is a subfield of linguistics computer science and artificial intelligence. And it is with the interaction basically between uh, computers and human language. So how computers can understand and process uh, human language. And examples of these kind of use case include autocomplete in search engines. And Amy just uh, also uh, talked about auto-suggestion, for example, on her smartphone, uh, but also chatbots, sentiment analysis, text classification, and, and more. But we will de we'll be dealing more with NLP in 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 the in the session. So I will pass to Amy for the next question. Okay, question number three. We're only three out of four, so there's still a chance. You've got to be the fastest person that types it. Okay, we're getting harder though. So next question. what does llm stand for you might hear it a lot when people are talking about things like chat gpt and stuff like that um and it's yeah you tell me what is it i won't give it away what does llm stand for we're yeah gradually getting harder we've only got four questions in total so this is three out of four one of the things I always find is people use the acronym and I think they know what it what it means, but don't actually often know what it stands for. But it stands for large language model. So let me zoom in a little here on some of the large language mode is a close one. Logical language model is a long language memory. Well, it has something to do with memory specifically. There's some good Good answers, great work, but it actually stands for large language model in which don't confuse it with, um, if you search for just LLM with no other context, I was finding it was coming up with things like, there's some kind of masters of law program. I don't know, that's, that's obviously the acronym for it, it must be LLM. And I was like, that's not what I'm looking for here as a definition. But a large language model is an, an algorithm. So it's a type of natural language process algorithm. And it currently understands and generates human-like language. Um, it's something that's quite new. Um, so it's a new way of building uh, a form of neural network architecture. But that's obviously a progression. Neural networks have been used quite frequently in the past. 
these different nodes and weights are trained in this interconnected model um, that allow it to understand patterns and generate similar patterns back out to you. So it takes in a huge amount of data from words and text. And what it's able to do is find lots of those patterns. Um, what are some of the ones that you've probably heard of? Open AI's uh, GPT-3 is a form of a large language model, and so is Google's BERT. So that kind of gives you context of where you might have been hearing these different things. Um, they, in, they increase uh, in complexity, but also in, in um, capability with the more data that you add. Uh, and one of the interesting things is they're actually able to do multiple different natural language processing scenarios. So whether you're looking at summarization, question answering, translation, this is something that kind of makes them a little bit different from maybe what we've seen in the past. So LLM stands for large language model. Carlotta, let me pass to you to, for the final question. Yeah, the final question is really a follow-up question to this one. Uh, and Amy, you also already um, um, uh, used this uh, acronym in your explanation of LLM. Uh, so uh, now uh, just share what you think GPT uh, stands for. You've heard a lot also in the media, I'm sure you've heard of GPT, uh, but do you, do you actually know what it stands for? So type your guess. And again, don't be shy. Um, I'm very curious. And you are doing a great job so far, so yes. keep doing it. And even even the ones that haven't been right, they make sense. That's the, yeah. like it's, it's yeah. the right area. That's right. <laughs> so again, we have uh, we have quite a good answer here. Um, GP text, generic pre-trained transformer, graphic processing technology. Uh, this is not really true, but thanks for guessing. Uh, uh, so uh, GPT, uh, what stands for? Uh, so GPT is generative pre-trained transformer. Uh, this was the, the right definition. And this refers basically to the architecture, but also the training method used for the large language model that powers the technology like the well-known chat GPT. Uh, the GPT model was developed by OpenAI and is based on an architecture called transformer architecture. Um, that, and that, that's, why, that's why we used GP, the GPT transformer in the acronym. Uh, and we'll be dealing with all of these during the session. So uh, I think that we have just one thing to reveal now, the, um, the final uh, leaderboard. And the winner, of course. So um, Mentimeter is calculating the points for us. Let's see the winner here. Otabek, congratulations. We have a winner. And congratulations to everyone. You were, you were great. Thanks for joining the competition. Yes, we appreciate it. There's no, uh, there's no prize, but there's, this is forever in a stream now. So it's, it's on the internet. Exactly. <laughs> so well you got the done. glory. <laughs> you got the glory indeed. Wonderful. Okay, so if we switch back to my slides, um, let me take you back in time. We've been talking a little bit here about hype. What's all the hype for? Um, we're hearing a lot about AI. We're hearing a lot about GPT-3, GPT-4. We're hearing a lot about all these different things. And one of the things I want to do is take you back in time a little bit. So let's go back to November 2021. And I want to show you a little bit as to what did Azure AI look like? So there's a lot in there, right? 2021, we've got Azure AI sits in the Microsoft Cloud. It's the AI platform and all of the services that sit underneath it. If we take a look at the different layers here, what you'll see at the bottom is our Azure machine learning service, your option to create bespoke machine learning models from code using all of these very, very popular frameworks, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, etc. being able to package up, model and deploy them, as well as manage them and build them into applications. So it's the whole end-to-end -end process. That's not for everyone. That's, you know, there's a certain skill set that comes with that. 
And so we also had our customizable AI models. Think of our Azure cognitive services, everything from vision capabilities to speech, language, and decision. And interestingly, at Microsoft Build, one of our biggest developer events here at Microsoft in the year, at Build 2021, we actually released a set of applied AI services. So we, can, we saw and heard from our customers how people were using our cognitive services. And then we built this set, of, this other layer of these scenario-based services on top of that. So think of things like Forms Recognizer. I remember when this landed. This is the combination of being able to take a, say, a PDF form, extract all of the information from it. Bearing in mind, it's technically analog, right? Like you can't get information out of a PDF that well. Being able to then put that into some kind of data store and search across the top of it was such a phenomenal use of an applied AI service. And sometimes and there were so many more. Uh, cognitive search, metrics advisor, do go and take a look at them. They're still there. They're still incredibly useful. But what then appeared, you'll just notice, is the open AI service. So back in November 2021, that was actually introduced as a, something that we were going to be partnering on. But then in January 2023, OpenAI became generally available and the partnership with Microsoft continued to carry on. And so at the Azure OpenAI service has landed as part of our customizable AI models. But before we got there, all of the this amazing service and its capabilities have actually been built into things like our application platforms, as well as our applications. You might have heard of some of the things We've been doing with Microsoft Bing, for example, a new search experience, as well as what we're building into things like Power Apps with our AI builder uh, technologies. The question I have for you now, I think, is when should I use what technology is probably tends to be the hardest question now in AI. Do I want to build everything myself down at the bottom or can I actually use it where it's built into a product now? Um, and so what I want, what we thought was useful was to actually start with some of the theory and then build you up across what you can use. So I'm going to pass to Carlotta, who's going to share her screen uh, and talk about what is the hype. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Amy, for this uh, introduction about Azure AI. Uh, let's uh, go back for a moment to this media hype uh, that we are we are seeing today. Uh, why is everyone talking about AI and in particular about generative AI? And we probably haven't seen a similar media phenomenon since the birth of social networks or smartphones, market launch, or even before with the birth of internet. Uh, but all those mediatic booms have mentioned it, including generative AI, um, if we think about it, have a common factor. And, and this is that they have the power to revolutionize our society and our day-to-day -day lives, which means they don't have only an impact on the technology domain and sphere, uh, but also in social one. However, today, uh, today that the majority of people on the globe has access to internet, uh, has access to smartphones and to social medias, of course, the speed with which the AI market progresses and the news reach the users is infinitely greater. Um, and uh, as always, Visualization helps a lot to make things clearer. With this graph, for example, it's easier to grasp the reason behind the media hype, since we can see how faster becomes the technology adoption for technologies born after 2005, for example. Um, like if you uh, if you um, see tablet, uh, the tablet speed of technology adoption, or the smartphone usage, or the social media usage, um, with respect to all the technologies like power steering here or microwave, um, even looking at more recent technologies invented in the last decade of the old century, uh, like internet, for example, the red line here, um, the adoption curves are way more gentle and less steep than today. And looking around, we can easily uh, predict how this trend will be confirmed by technologies powered by generative AI, uh, whose speed of adoption could be uh, probably the highest we have ever seen. But um, talking about media and about announcements, uh, let's go over just a few of the updates that have been announced in the last few months. Let, let's recall that. 
Uh, so um, almost one year ago, uh, in June 2022, we had uh, the announcement of GitHub Copilot, an AI-empowered pair programmer uh, that has been unleashed for all developers and available on the most common IDEs. I, uh, I encourage you to, um, uh, to, to try GitHub Copilot, which is also free for all students if you, if you didn't uh, try it before. And then in October 2022, uh, we, we have seen the birth of Microsoft Designer, enabling content creators to generate high quality graphics using AI. Um, then again, early this year in January 2023, uh, Azure OpenAI service uh, is, um, has become generally available and a reinforced partnership with, between OpenAI and Microsoft has been announced with all workloads of OpenAI models running now on Azure. Um, then in February 2023, the new Microsoft Bing with search capabilities empowered by generative AI has become available. Um, and more recently, in March 2023, we had ChatGPT and GPT-4 families of models um, added to the Azure OpenAI service offering. And also Microsoft 365 Suite, uh, which now includes some preview AI-empowered features called Copilot able to revolutionize probably the way of working and it interacting with office tools. So, uh, and we really believe that we can expect lots of new incredible updates in the following months. So this is just uh, the beginning, we could, we could say. Um, and uh, to understand what, what really has changed uh, in, in, the last, uh, in the last couple of years, um, and what really all this, this hype is about, let's do, uh, a step back, uh, because if we enlarge the time window, we can observe how things weren't always so fast as today. Um, the first project in the artificial intelligence domain date back to 60s, when the first researchers began to explore the possibility to create machines able to replicate some of the human cognitive capabilities, for example, conversation. And initially, symbolic reason was a prevalent approach, and it led to a number of important successes, such as Eliza, which is the first typewritten chatbot acting as a psychiatrist. Um, however, it soon became clear that such approach does not scale well. It was um, uh, based on the, um, on, the, on, the, on the fact of extracting the knowledge from an expert, then representing it into a computer and keeping this knowledge base uh, always accurate. And all of these turns, to be, turns out to be a very complex task. Um, also too expensive with the, um, with the hardware um, available at the time. And this led to uh, a, a period of uh, discouragement uh, through the um, so-called AI winter in the 1970s. Um, a turning point arrives during 90s with the technology evolution of the hardware, cheaper and more capable to handle large amount of data. Uh, together with the creation of new algorithms classified as machine learning, able to learn patterns from data with, without being explicitly programmed uh, with specific instructions as before. And in particular, new statistical models called neural networks, so inspired by the biological structure of the brain made up of interconnected neurons, gave a boost to the AI research development, being able to work well also with more complex inputs, so not only categories or numbers, but also images, audio. And these statistical models belonging to a subgroup of machine learning uh, defined as deep learning benefited also of the availability of more powerful type of elaboration unit, the GPUs. Um, then the modern virtual assistants born in the first decade of the new century, like Siri, Cortana, or Google Assistant, um, are also built upon language models based on neural networks. And they are very proficient in a subdomain of AI that we have seen also in our uh, small competition, which is natural language processing. Um, uh, Identify the specific need in the input request from the user, these kind of technologies are able to pair it with a suitable answer, retrieved via web search or in a list of predefined answers. Um, Last but, uh, last but not least, today we have the cutting edge technology of AI, which is generative a AI. Uh, it is able to generate examples starting from a huge amount of data used to train a model. And when I say huge, I think about all the data publicly accessible on the internet, so very huge. 
that's why we talk about large models because of the amount of data used for the training, but also because of the number of calculations that are able to handle at the same time. And the examples those models are able to create could be of different type, um, from text to code to images. Uh, in this image here, for example, I know it's it's teeny, uh, but there's an example in which the user asks for um, ask the model to write a poetry, and the model generates a poetry as as output. So you can already guess how powerful this kind of uh, of models are. Um, but um, now that we know a little bit of history, I would like also to cover what's behind the scenes of a language models. And I'll try to keep it simple. I don't want to go too much technical, but I think that having an overview of how the training and prediction processes work for a large for a language model and how these um, has evolved with the recent research advancements can be helpful to really understand what those models are capable of doing, but also uh, what they are not capable of doing. And let's start, let's start with the basics. Let's start by explaining how a neural network processes a sentence, for example. Um, and the title of this slide wants to be provocative uh, with understands in quotation marks, since AI is not really capable of understanding anything. But this will be clear at the end of this explanation. Um, so first of all, let me say that we are talking about statistical models. Um, neural networks are based on statistical models. So it could be intuitive as those models work better with numbers more than words. And the first challenge to face then is how we, we can convert words, uh, a sentence, into numbers. And there are, and there are three fundamental steps to do so. Uh, the first one is starting from a text, split this text into smaller pieces, which are known as tokens. Um, and talk, a token has a dimension which vary from a language to another, um, but this uh, this dimension is usually between a character and the word. Um, but to make things simpler in this explanation, we'll be using the terms token and the terms word uh, interchangeably. Now, once the text is split into smaller pieces, into tokens, you see here that each word is uh, with a token. Um, we can build a, a dictionary such that every word is mapped with a number. And there are multiple algorithms to do this encoding, which is called embedding. Um, a very popular one, for example, is called bag of words, um, which create those mappings by taking into account the frequency of each word inside the text. Uh, but the main thing, the key thing to, um, to keep in mind here is that we are uh, splitting the text into smaller pieces and then mapping these smaller pieces to numbers, okay? So second step, uh, once we have done this, is defining a standard length for our embedding space, which means defining a standard size for a vector uh, which will represent my text. So we want to convert this text into a vector of number, and we want this vector to, to have a standardized length for every text we, are, we, we process. Uh, for example, let's take 10 as size as dimension for our embedding space then means we'll build an array of 10 numbers, collecting the numbers mapped to the token. So you see here that every map number is uh, collected into this array. Uh, plus, when we have, um, if the input text is shorter than the predefined standard dimension, the rest of the array is populated using a placeholder, for example, zero. So you see here that we have a missing, um, a missing place here. So we put a placeholder, which is a zero. So at the end of the second step, we'll get basically a vector of a standardized size that we have chosen as 10, uh, a vector of numbers representing my original text. Um, awesome. Now, once my text has been converted to this array of number, I can use this input for the training of a neural network. Um, because if you remember at the beginning, I've said that neural network works well with numbers. Now, the way this works is that each node making up the network is activated or not by an activation function. Um, and uh, the output of a node is the input of the following one in a chain called forward propagation. Um, from this training process, I will get 
a space of dimension 10, because I've chosen 10 as dimension of my space, where the tokens of my input text are represented grouped into clusters of similarity, such that words with similar meanings are closer ones to another in the semantic space. For example, you see here that he, that he and she uh, are represented very close in the space, or coffee and tea are again represented closer in the space. Uh, and you see in this slide uh, the resulting space represented as a two-dimensional space, but um, it's just because the, it's the most intuitive way to represent and understand the reality. But in our example, this space should be a 10-dimensional space. Awesome. So we have our representation of our text uh, into a space. Um, and now um, we should um, we should think, is this, is this enough? Is this enough to process and understand the text? Um, now, um, we, we, we should think that um, th there's something that in this process we didn't uh, talk about, which is the context. And the context matters. Um, what, what this means? So the same word, we know that the same word can assume a different meaning according to the context in which it's used. And let's take uh, a practical example. We have this sentence, she had coffee, uh, and we have a second sentence, which is she had strength. Uh, you see here that I'm using the same verb here, at least in English, in a language like Italian, you would use a different uh, verb. But in English, we have the same term, the term had. Uh, but this same verb have a different meaning in the two sentences. Uh, and uh, how we can understand that it has a different meaning based on the context, which in this case means based on the word following the term had. So coffee in one case and strength in the other case. And this means that we need to convert the words into some more complex ideas, such that the two had represented here um, in the semantic space are not very close one another, because even if it's the same uh, verb, it has a different meaning. Um, so the semantic proximity should be computed on the on this idea, on this complex idea. So taking into account of the immediate context to the term. Um, and this is exactly how the recurrent neural network, which are the neural networks more, more commonly used in the NLP domain, work. So they process collection of words included into a predefined linear window um, as the model reads and analyzes uh, a text. So once we encode uh, these collection of words into a more complex idea, uh, it's also possible to decode it into the desired output, which varies according to the domain of application. In our example, uh, the application is a translation from English to Italian, so the output is uh, the translated sentence in, in Italian. Um, and the, um, so the cool thing is that once you uh, have the encoder and the decoder to translate from English to Italian, you can also apply them in the opposite direction and translate from Italian to English. Now, at this point, you can argue that um, I'm talking about recurrent neural networks, how recurrent neural networks work. You can argue that they are not so new, right? So if those models were already able to do those types of computation, why the newest large language models are so revolutionary? So why we are talking about why we are even talking about those things? Well, the main limit of recurrent neural networks is indeed the way that works, the basic the basics of how they work. Uh, because a recurrent neural network, we have say that they uh, use the so-called immediate context, context, so the few words around the term in analysis. And where's the issue? Let's imagine um, we have this text, so this sentence, Mary already had had coffee that morning, so she didn't accept a cup of iced coffee his colleague offered her. Okay, so now let's imagine that we would like our model to answer a question like, why didn't Mary accept the coffee? Now, to answer to a question like this, our model should be able to correlate the expression didn't accept the coffee with the, the, the subject she, and then she, the pronoun she, with the name Mary. Because in the question, I, don't, I have expl the explicit name Mary. 
and this and and this covers a quite long window of words you see here almost 15 words probably um, and greater is the dimension of this linear window used by the neural network greater is the complexity of the model the cost of its training and also the probability of of error uh, so now the invention enabling uh, the uh, revolution in the deep networks domain uh, has been the so-called um, um, mechanism of attention. Uh, and again, uh, this is inspired by the cognitive capability of the human brain of giving different weight to the input we receive, such that we can focus, for example, on a voice speaking to us and isolate it from a noisy background. Uh, similarly, the basic idea of the deep network attention mechanism uh, is that each time the model tries to predict an output word, it only uses parts of an input where the most relevant information is concentrated instead of the, of the entire sentence. Uh, so a new neural network architecture has been built upon attention mechanism called transformer architecture. And this architecture uses what is called multi-head attention, combining multiple heads uh, as they were multiple intelligences in a way that the model can attend to different parts of the input sequence simultaneously, uh, analyzing multiple possible combination of words relations. Uh, and basically this allows to overcome the linear and fixed size window of word of the recurrent neural networks empowering deep networks to learn semantic meaning without proximity, so without the limit of the size of the window. Uh, that's great. So uh, now that we have defined what is a transformer architecture, we can recall the transformer word we use in the, in the acronym we have defined at the beginning, uh, GPT, Generative Pre-trained Transformer. OK, so that's what is the transformer here. Um, and in this slide, I wanted to um, give you an overview of the progress of the generations from the first generation of GPT called GPT-1 to the newest one, GPT-4. Um, so these generations of models include models trained with a vast amount of unsupervised data from various sources. Um, think about books, articles, websites, and more. Uh, such that the model can learn a general representation of the language, which can then be fine-tuned for specific tasks, uh, like ChatGPT, which has been built from GPT-3.5 and then fine-tuned for the conversation domain. Um, and we can observe a progression throughout the years from the very first GPT-1 model born in 2018 uh, and trained with hundreds of millions of, uh, of parameters up to the very new GPT-4 model much larger and trained on hundreds of trillions of parameters. So we are saying 500 times bigger than GPT-3. Um, and the size of parameters increase more and more from one version to the next one, together with the dimension of the semantic space resulting in better performance and efficiency. However, the size of the model is, is not the only criterion to consider here in terms of the evolution of the models. The model has evolved also in terms of the variety of different domains or modalities that it can handle, and its capacity to apply the knowledge and skills across different contexts or disciplines. For example, GPT-4 demonstrates a high-level proficiency in literature, mathematics, music, medicine, and accepts both text and visual type of inputs. Also, um, those models had evolved and have been used by more and more users, so it is also possible to analyze prompts from user and corresponding behaviors and use those insights to continuously improve and refine the new generations of the model. Um, and in addition to different generation of the models, so GPT-1, GPT-2, et cetera, you might have heard also about different families of models per each generation. You can see, for example, uh, in this table, you can see the mapping between um, the one generation of the model and its families. Uh, so you have Ada, Babbage, Curie, Da Vinci. These identify the uh, capability and cost of each uh, specific model into a generation of models. Um, and you can learn more at this page. If you go to aka.ms slash AOAI dash models, you can learn more about all the models available on Azure OpenAI service. 
Um, and before um, coming back to Hemi again uh, for uh, explaining more about Azure OpenAI service, I just want to uh, recall here some key terms we'll be using. We, we've used the term prompt. What's the prompt? The prompt is um, basically an input to the model. Um, and this can uh, be a, a simple incipit of a sentence, but also uh, can contain additional context providing guidance about the task to execute the model, for example. Um, then another key term is completion. The completion is basically the output of the model. And then we have talked about token, which is the smallest unit in which language models split the text to process it. So keep in mind those terms throughout uh, uh, your learning journey with large language models. Um, and, now, and now I'll be, um, uh, I'll be let Amy to talk more about uh, the partnership with between OpenAI and Microsoft. That's amazing. Thank you, Carlotta. Yeah, the theory, I just want to give a big shout out to everyone in the chat. Lots of great questions. As me and Carlotta are uh, not speaking, we'll kind of head into the chat and answer different things. So thank you, everyone. Martin S asked a little bit about the pricing around Azure OpenAI services. Just wanted to call out check out that pricing page. We're going to cover it in a minute, but Carlos had just mentioned it there also, understanding all the different models that are available within the GPT models is um, super important. And there's a really great page there that kind of describes them. So thank you so much for bringing that one up very timely. And I very quickly just want to talk to you a little bit about OpenAI and Microsoft and the kind of partnership that's uh, been, been building there. So, First and foremost, this is a partnership. OpenAI is a company that ensures that general artificial intelligence benefits humanity. And Microsoft is, is obviously a company that does many things, but we empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And we've come together as, a, as two companies to work to, to make this type of technology available to people. This has led to lots of different things kind of happening. OpenAI produces lots of different uh, types of interaction. So ChatGPT here is probably the one you've heard of the most, this conversational agent is the, is the one maybe sort of mainstream media hears about the most. That's actually built on a GPT model. So there is an opportunity to just do prompts and uh, completions as well as the ability to get code back through the Codex model and also imagery via DALI, which you may have heard of as well. So let's dig into those different examples because they're very, very difficult to understand in this context, but I have some good graphics for you to explain them. So here we go. Here's all of our different examples and all of the different types of models and, uh, and ways of interacting. So let's start over on the left here with the GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. You prompt a piece of text, and in this case, this model also returns text as the completion. So if we were to ask it, write a tagline for an ice cream shop, it would provide us a response that say, we serve up smiles with every scoop, which is very witty and, uh, and creative in this case. If you then take that one step further, that's when we get into this chat GTP uh, moment where we might prompt it with a conversation. So we might have, say, I have trouble getting the Xbox to turn on. It might come back with a few responses and then you can continue that conversation and it has understanding of the previous things that have come before it. So then when you ask, what games do you recommend for, the, for my 14 year old? it will come back with games within the Xbox platform. So it will obviously take that understanding from the previous question and apply it in a conversational format. If we continue across the slide for Codex, we might prompt it with the description of a table. If any of you have done SQL or MySQL, you'll recognize this type of syntax. We've got a table of customers where we say that we've got these specific columns, customer ID, first name, last name, etc. And we ask it, can you create a SQL query for all customers in Texas named Jane uh, and provide that query? And in response, it will provide us that SQL query at the bottom. That's <laughs> incredible in some senses. 
and think about all those times you have to do that constant searching for how do I do this again how do I do this again but at the end of the day you're the person that tests that code you're the person that um, reviews that code and you build it into applications so it's a very very interesting way uh, of doing different code completions and then finally Dali which is we provide a text prompt again so a ball of fire with vibrant colors to show the speed of innovation at our media entertainment company and it provides the imagery back um, so there's lots, lots and lots of different things that can be provided back, but it's interesting that what goes into um, these models via OpenAI currently is text. So do keep that in mind. Now, how does that sit with the kind of Azure OpenAI service? Well, we add on a layer to be able to serve that. So if you have that capability, which is built by OpenAI, that's now available in Azure by the Azure OpenAI service. One, some of the nice things that relate to that is you have all of the things that come with the Microsoft Cloud. So it sits in your Azure subscription, which is accessible to you and those that, you know, within your organization or uh, within your team that you allow into your subscription, for example. That put all of your data sets are in there, all of your applications are in there as well. And so connecting these services together within an architecture it's going to be a lot easier in that sense. You also have obviously that great enterprise grade security. Security is incredibly important um, with both data and AI workloads, as they are obviously very, very visible workloads. And obviously, it's around that as well, networking. This is kind of called our Microsoft Intelligent Data Platform. So, the ability to be able to um, use all of our services within one sphere. And we'll talk a little bit about how using Azure OpenAI services, it never is on its own, right? It's always part of a bigger architecture and Carlos will cover that in a little bit. I wanted to briefly talk about some scenarios. So there's lots of great top use cases on this slide that show how people are using the Azure OpenAI service and these OpenAI uh, features. So things like summarization, um, things like conversations, as we saw with the chat GTP piece, things like knowledge mining and understanding and asking questions of our data directly rather than having to kind of click around and find out the data insights. Things are now able to just ask questions of data and it provides that back. Two things I personally want to highlight, which I found sort of the most impressive when looking at this sort of from historically to now, is the writing assistance category and the fast sort of software development. The writing assistance, this idea of creative ideation, design, human-like language, and uh, is for me what I see as some of the, the big differences kind of going on here. That's something, you know, summarization, we've technically been able to do that previously. The quality of this is incredibly good, right? So we, we have moved on. However, something like content writing assistance and stuff like that, that for me is something that I found incredibly impressive. Uh, same with the, the code generation, the autocomplete, the you know, docu writing documentation for your code that you've written or refactoring, for example, is just such a great application for some of these things. So do, do take a look into some of those use cases. Finally, I kind of want to call it out very, very specifically. Azure AI is not equivalent to the Azure OpenAI service. What it is, is the Azure OpenAI service is a part of the Azure AI platform. So let me show you this again, because we've seen it at the start and we'll see it again now. The Azure AI platform encompasses many, many, many different technologies and OpenAI services I've just highlighted there is just one of a huge amount of things that you can use. And so I don't want to be like, you know, we call, a lot of people call it a mood hoover. Um, a mood hoover is someone who sucks all the excitement out of something. I don't want to be that person. But there is also this element that you've got to consider when to use the Azure OpenAI service. So if you use it, human-like, uh, sorry, sorry, you need to use a model with little or no training if you wish, and you want to explore some of those use cases and solutions we saw on the last slide, 
if you're ticking a lot of these boxes, it's absolutely the place that you should be looking at. However, a lot of our services are also very valuable. So anything in the vision category, the speech category, the language category, all those applied AI services where we might have already put together multiple tasks. So I talked about the forms recognizer earlier. Phenomenal. It brings together many, many different things that you can do in order to apply it to a certain scenario. So same thing, just consider what you're using it for. And also back to Martin's question around pricing. Yeah, do consider the price and the pricing is um, uh, consider what regions it's currently in. Uh, also how how kind of those different models what do they mean when do i use them what's the recommended first approach for example and then on the next bit on top of this where you provide your data set to find this baseline model that comes with hosting of these models etc so just consider the collective uh, sort of ability of that pricing. And I've put that link in AOAI, so Azure Open AI um, model. Those different um, available to you. Okay. What have I talked about there? I've talked a little bit about Azure AI being the platform, Azure OpenAI service being a part of that, where we've partnered with OpenAI, the company, to provide this great, um, these great features on our cloud for easy access of use. However, they're not the only part of the Azure AI platform, and actually bringing these services together is where we're seeing them be most powerful. So I want to pass to uh, Carlotta, who's going to show us a very quick demo, is going to bring all of this to life for us. Uh, yeah, thanks, Amy. So let me share my screen now, because as, as you said, uh, I would like to um, really uh, re resume everything we have uh, we have told so far with with uh, with a demo. In particular, what I would like to show you is how we can really rely on prompt engineering to customize the output of uh, the answers and the output of our of our models. For example, we can um, also inject in our prompt in our input to the model some uh, data source, some customized data source that we want to. Um, that we want to uh, that we want the model to use in the uh, in the answers, and uh, the demo will be showing you. It's also a great example of how you can combine different Azure services into a single solution. Um, in in this solution, we'll be basically using Azure Cognitive Service to index some PDF documents. Um, which um, has been processed also by another service called Azure Form Recognizer to extract the text from images, from tables, and other type of structured um, um, form text. Uh, and then we have built a web app with a, um, with a front end uh, used by the final user to ask questions to the data, so to chat with uh, with, directly with the, the data source and the backend, which basically is an orchestrator of all those uh, different Azure services. So let me jump directly to my browser where I have the app running. Um, and the graphing interface you see here um, really allows us to chat with some private data. So let's imagine that we have uh, a few private data from a the Contoso company, which is a fictional company, which which we take with example, uh, and we uh, and uh, think that we have indexed all these uh, all, all a few files like this one you see here, uh, some PDF files with Azure Cognitive Search uh, in a way to be able to query those files in a quick uh, and easy manner. Um, so let's chat with our data, and it will be uh, easier to grasp. 
what 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 does it mean chat with with the data um, uh, with with an example? So let's use a, a the the first question we have here. Uh, these PDF files contain basically information about employees' benefits, and this Northwin Health Plus plan is an health plan that the Contoso employees' benefit can um, can 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 get as uh, as a as a benefit of being employee of Contoso. Um, so let's ask, let's send this um, this question to our app, which basically makes uh, um, the Azure Cognitive Search and the Azure Open AI service uh, uh, work work together to um, search the information uh, we need uh, from the indexed files and then generate an answer like this in a natural language. Uh, and you see here that the answer also contain the citation to uh, the original document in a way that the final user can also basically uh, double check the correctness of the information on, on its own. Uh, and also the other cool thing of this app is that it can show the full process of what's behind the scene of this of these answer. Uh, so we have the, the, the search here, um, the, the use for query my files, and then I have the prompt. And let's see how the prompt is uh, is designed in a way that it contains basically um, the uh, the design of a persona uh, of the assistant that the model should pretend to be. Uh, and this um, and this persona is basically an assistant helping the company employees with a healthcare healthcare plan questions, and it should answer only with the facts listed in the list of sources below. And the list of sources is no more than the result of the Azure Cognitive Search looking into the, into the documents we have passed to the service. Um, and also another thing we ask to the model is really to put in the answer also the data source cited in the um, in the in the answer itself. So uh, that's why we can get a so much customized. Um, uh, answer because we are really um, giving to the model a very accurate uh, and well-defined prompt, and also we are um, attaching here in the in the prompt the data source uh, in which uh, the model should uh, look for the answer, and um, that of course it, it could not find in a public uh, source because. Uh, this is really specific to the Contoso company, so specific to the Contoso data. Uh, and then we are also attaching, as you can see here, the history of the conversation. And um, if I ask another question to, the, to this app, it will uh, add again uh, the, my, my second question in a way that the model can basically access the history of the conversation at each time. Um, and and this really uh, makes the model pretend it knows um, it, it has a memory of um, uh, of all the of all the context of our conversation. Um, so coming back to the deck, another thing I would like to um, uh, to really emphasize, and I've seen some questions around these also in the chat, uh, is that. Uh, the output of a generative AI models is not perfect. And sometimes the, the creativity of the model can also work against it, resulting in an output which is a combination of words the human user can interpret as a mystification of reality or uh, uh, as offensive. So let's recall also the, the limitation of this uh, technology. The generative AI is not intelligent. It is not deterministic because it can output different um, answers from the same prompt and it's not trustworthy because it can hallucinate some answers it cannot understand anything basically language maths or emotions and it cannot know facts that are not in its training data set as gpt3 didn't know for example about the death of queen elizabeth um but uh, and this is important because we 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 need to uh, uh, remind ourselves that we we should ensure to use the AI output responsibly. And what does it mean? How we can mitigate these um, uh, these hallucination or these unexpected behaviors from from the model? 
with uh, effective prompt engineering. So as I've shown you in the demo, uh, by really designing uh, the, the kind of output we, we would like and give uh, accurate instructions to the model. Then provide, for example, validated data source, again, as, as I've shown you in the, in the demo, in which we provided the model with uh, PDF files. And then tweaking parameters like the temperature, which is the degree of randomness of the model, or the max length of the output, or applying content filterings that can help us moderating both the prompt uh, and uh, the, the output. All of those tools are available on Azure OpenAI service and uh, help us really to guide us to use AI, generative AI responsible, uh, since these uh, technologies are so, are so powerful. Um, and before concluding, um, Amy, do, would you like to um, provide us some uh, learning resources? Sure, yeah, of course. So um, firstly, thank you everyone for in the chat for asking such great questions. Hopefully we got to a few of them. If we didn't get to your question, this is the slide for you. Please go and check out all these great learning resources. So if you go to aka.ms slash AOAI slash learn, you'll find this whole list uh, on, a, on a GitHub page for you, where you can you know, bookmark that as your favorite page, obviously. Um, and can come back to it whilst you're on this learning journey. There's so much for us to cover in an hour. We're one minute over. Uh, this is just the start. So please consider this you know, a great way to get started and to listen to this great context, but also to kind of take this away and continue learning. So get started by signing up for the service, continue to learn the basics from learn modules, from documentation, consider what it looks like to fine tune this and then also have the opportunity to get help and other resources as you continue into sort of that advanced understanding. Um, and then last but not least, we have an event coming up. I just spoke about it interestingly right at the start um, about a uh, how Microsoft Build was a place where we kind of talked a bit about the applied AI services. Microsoft Build is coming up May 23rd to the 25th. So oh, what are we, 21 days out at this point? And um, please register for Microsoft Build today. There's going to be some amazing things happening there. Lots of information um, around all sorts of different technologies, but also the ability for you to continue your learning journey with some of the latest and greatest. So go to aka.ms slash build to go and register today. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, be able to start building some out so, and seeing some of the sessions shortly. Awesome. So see you everyone at Build at this point and thank you so much for joining the session today. All right. See you later.